I'm very excited to be here and humbled and honored um, to be talking about Michael Van Valkenburg's Millrace Park because I used to live right next to one in Brooklyn Bridge and now I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma and he's developing a huge new waterfront there along the Arkansas River and now I get to actually respond to one of his, his parks. Um, I use textiles and fabric, that's my background, as well as painting and sculpture to give um, unrecognized or underrecognized, underused sites uh, a new perspective. And I've uh, made a video that I'm going to show you first of all to just get a jumping off point, some framework for, from, um, to have in your imagination when I start to talk about the park right after the video. Here it goes. Just so that I don't have to talk over the whole thing. The bottom right is just photos of influences and references.
That felt really long sitting there. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> I was geeking out to my own. Enough about me. Now on to the park. Upon first seeing the park I, and being assigned this site, uh, I was kind of obsessing over the round lake. But then on the site visit, visits in September, I you know, was able to walk around it and realized how big of an impact the bridge had on that site and also the other side of the lake that is um, more natural side of the lake. And then, of course, the symposium and thinking about the site. And um, the bottom right is a slide by Richard or Bill Chrysler's lecture. On, um, I just really loved his description of taking something hard and smoothing it over, basically. But I also really wanted to connect the one side of the lake to this other side of the uh, the park. The more um, pristine, organized side to the uh, um, more natural side. But I couldn't figure out a way to do it without hurting the bridge. The way to go over and not have those cables be running over and rubbing or even fabric sitting on a bridge could color it if it got wet, stain it, and um, and I didn't want to really build something that attached to the bridge. And so just I knew I wanted the piece to come out of the water and have a relationship with the water on both sides. So I came up, you go through the bridge, and you use the bridge as an armature, and you use those windows are a natural uh, through point. And then you, I decide, like, how wide is it? Is it follow the channel that's 50 feet wide underneath the bridge, or does it um, expand the whole length of the windows? How far does it come out into the lake? <coughs> this is it following the channel and coming about halfway through the lake, about 150, 200 feet out. In the pink, I'll say the pink lines are cables, steel cables, and the color is fabric. I think it should go all the way across the lake and expand, um, go from window to window for it to have an impact and also to create the space underneath the, you'd be, I'd be creating a canopy uh, that you could go under and walk through under the bridge and to the other side. And also, um, well, I'll just keep talking. The, the top <laughs> photo is 25 feet above your head and then the middle is about 15 feet, and the bottom is about 10 feet. And it all depends. Obviously, the one on the bottom, you'd have to do, make it narrower and stay within the channel that's below the bridge. I think that the 25-foot option would be ideal. This is one strip of fabric that's approximately 125 feet wide, 100 wide, 100 feet wide. And just the shadows and reflections of the water that happen with just one <coughs> is pretty awesome. But I like to imagine the whole thing is covered with panels of fabric, and it's uh, pretty lightweight ripstop. And uh, so then I decide. Is it a patchwork? Does it have a patchwork feeling? Or is it uh, more blips of color kind of radiating across? Or is it stripes? 
or is it a combination of the two, which I, I like? <coughs> There's, people use that bridge. Some people don't even walk around the, the, the round lake. They're just driving through or running through or racing through. So inside there's, uh, it, the inside does not get skipped. It is part of both sides. That's a silhouette of the expanse that it would be covering. The blue is the space in between the cabled fabric and the water. The back torques. I wanted the back and the front to have two different personalities. So the back has a, a different, um, is saying something different than the front. I would hope that someone would, upon seeing this from a distance, would want to maybe come up and um, perhaps walk through it and under it, and maybe they've never even gone to the other side of that, uh, through the bridge and to the other side that's more natural. <coughs> If clearance is an issue, I also love the idea of it just being a striped panel that accentuates the length of the bridge. It comes out of the water. It's a part of the water. The water will ebb and flow into the fabric. And if there's a flood, it's built for that, just like the park. <laughs> you can still see the piece. Uh, this is, uh, the fabric is ripstop <coughs> nylon or flab cut fabric, fabric. The nylon is very lightweight. And I'm talking about having to use thousands of yards of fabric. And so how do you recycle that and give it a new life? And um, this whole project is funded by the community. And so I reached out to um, a local organization that helps uh, women and children. And um, upon, I was speaking with Diane Haas. I don't know if she's here, but I invited her today. And um, we were talking about what do, what do people need when they are, are, you know, escaping from their life and they, they're getting their donations and what do they, uh, what could they use? What could this fabric be turned into and, and reused for? And um, so we were t talked about bags. People get these donations and they often leave with them in tr with trash bags. The kids that are coming, they have to take a trash bag to school because they don't have their backpack because they had to leave it at home. So I made a couple of samples of, for, of reused, of an old project and made a couple of bags and I think, it, I think it could be a really a good opportunity to um, have the piece come full circle and back into the people. And you know, it can live as a big spectacle at first for, I, I hate, I use that word because that, it just happens with all the color and the movement, but um, you know, just a visual feast. And then it can also have, come back and have an intimate experience um, with your body. And um, the rest of the material can be recycled through San Sushi, which is a local thrift store re textile recycler. And because, and I mean, I could use some of it too, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want thousands of yards. I'd love to figure out something else to do with it. And, okay, and that's where I'll leave it. Good. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for that beautiful presentation. Um, it, by the way, a uh, great soundtrack to the video. Is sound a big part of your work? Yes. I mean, the, this, I, there definitely would be like a rustling of, of material that you would hear. And I, I think of um, even like using uh, color in like a staccato or, you know, have a, a long finish. You know, my dad's a musician. And um, 
I just, yeah, it is a big part. I think, I mean, unexpected things happen with the, uh, with the sound and the, the materials themselves. And I could imagine standing, you know, someone wanting to have a more quiet moment at the park by themselves and, and just like listening to the fabric blowing and rustling. So uh, thank you. Uh, I was drawn by a lot of your your um, uh, your bottom right hand images as well, and I was thinking about the history of quilts and quilts as narratives and quilts having not only personal histories embedded in them but community histories embedded in, in them. So I was curious if you had thought about the production. Uh, of your project in association with other people, that this wasn't just you making or sewing uh, these pieces together, or if you would involve the community in an, in ways. I yeah, definitely. In um, I've, I mean, there's some local, there's a a local sewer that I've been in talks with um, and there's also I think an opportunity to even like um, to reach out to find volunteer or you know community yes definitely <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely <laughs> what I'm trying to say is yes I love that idea <laughs> and I would love to like help facilitate that in any way because it's it's it would be thousands of yards of hemming and um, <laughs> attaching, and I would love to teach someone to come make a special visit and teach a workshop on how to do that. Can you explain a little bit more about the um, inside the bridge, how the cables are going through? Is there going to be any connecting to the bridge of any sort? Well, I, yeah, I, um, I've been talking with Brian McCutcheon, who's a local fabricator up in Indianapolis. And we've come up with several different uh, ideas that, um, you know, you could, let's see, you could devise a, a clamp that fits over the beams so that the cable can run through that so that it's not touching the wood. Like, essentially, the piece would not touch the bridge at all. And um, Depending on you know what the engineers say and how much weight is pulling down, you might have to um, actually build a small or you know like a invisible um, buttress system that could you know that's kind of you know taking the the panel the cables all the way to both sides of the windows from end of bridge to end of the bridge makes it easier to, um, if you did have to reinforce the bridge with an arm that could just extend out to <coughs> funnel the cable through. And I was thinking um, if you did have to build an armature, <coughs> it would be best to do it on the edges closer to the road so that you're not putting force in the middle of the bridge. Um, just a point of clarification. In your presentation, the way that many of the illustrations um, depict the installation, it seems like the panels are uh, independent and they hang vertically, yet your model is a monolithic surface that's on the diagonal. Which direction are you actually going in? <laughs> it, I mean, it, would, it, it would be more like this, like where there's individual cables and individual pieces of fabric hanging, mm -hmm. hanging down. Um, every five feet is what I'm thinking. They'd be four feet, four foot panels, and they would be hanging every five feet, and closer together within the bridge. So, uh, is it gradient? Like, oh, the expand, like closer versus farther. Mm, no. Then, and I would want one right up, I mean, it starts right at the window so that when you're inside the bridge, 
there's light filtering through the fabric, kind of acting almost like stained glass. And now the first panels would have to be shorter because you wouldn't want, um, the windows are like two feet wide by 10 feet wide, or two feet tall by 10 feet wide. So I'm thinking the first ones would maybe be two or three feet so that they're not slapping against the wood and shredding themselves. That was touching upon my question a bit. Um, it, it seems like from the video, it is very responsive to light and creating patterns underneath it, um, as well as the wind. And have you studied the um, kind of climate uh, of that area from August to November? Is there a high wind that comes in? Um, I, it's not necessarily tornado season, which is good. Like, you wouldn't, I don't, I, I think it's actually the perfect time for this material. I would say it has like a three to six month lifespan, the ripstop. So it's, it's, you couldn't ask for a better climate at that time. Um, I would imagine that the material would fade a little bit and also, and, uh, with the sun but it's not going to like deteriorate. Okay. And it would, probably wouldn't be noticeable to you guys, but I would notice that the color changed from when, from when it started. Um, these bags are from oh. a used project, uh, a previous project? Yeah, these bags are from an older project. And um, I was just making one myself, trying to figure out like, is this something that, um, you know, like that I can, that I want to do? Is this something that I'm capable of doing? And that, yeah, this is, they're both pretty simple. I was imagining like, okay, um, the mom's got to carry pillows and blankets and the kids clothes and everything, so she would need a bigger bag. And then the kid, the child could have um, a bag to take to school. And most times when you're getting donated bags, they're just made out of, um, you know, I'm thinking of like duffel bags that are maybe um, a more u utilitarian, uh, I don't know, canvas or just plain. And I, I was thinking of um, making something that someone would be proud of carrying and not feel like they're standing <coughs> out with like a mismatched, like um, a credit old bag that. <laughs> Another question on the um, the cables. What did you decide on the anchoring um, in the water? Okay, so there's there's uh, there's a possibility of there being a bladder under some of the um, under the silt. So you wouldn't want to puncture that by like screwing a giant anchor into it. And um, so the answer that we've been brainstorming would be weights. What do you weight that with? Um, do you build like or pour giant, giant concrete forms and then have a, a huge crane set them in place? That would maybe eat up the whole budget. Um, <laughs> but a tank like this that's used for like uh, fuel or spraying, you could fill with pea gravel and have it, and you could even like get two or three of these and they come in, in any kind of size and bolt them, set them in empty and fill them up on site. And then, um, you know, depending on how much weight you actually need to, to make it, I mean, you can make that thing as big as you needed to under the water. And then it would also be easy for removal because we've been looking up um, giant vacuums, even a shop vac. You could get, have, be on a boat with a shop vac or, um, and be sucking the pea gravel out. Or, but if you, if you extend the cables all the way to the edge of the, of the lake, then you're not, um, then you can do all of that from land. Just one last question. What will determine whether it goes to land or the water? Is it the counterweight? Is it budget? Like, is it partially dependent on? I think no matter what, it's going to come from the water. It has to, because it has to be like in and of the water. It's coming out of the water and re 
turn into the water. So, um, you know, if it if it comes to the edge, I don't. I really at this point I don't see why it couldn't come to the edge. It's t because um, <coughs> I showed some of those other slides. Is just kind of trying to like show you how I generate the came to what I'm. So if it went edge to edge, what is that largest dimension? Or five hundred feet. Wow. But the but it would probably sink into the water a hundred feet before or two hundred feet be, or one hundred fifty feet, you know, somewhere in between there before it even came to the edge. So the last few rows would be underwater. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.